very grateful to be here. Uh, I apologize for not being able to speak Portuguese. My friends in England tell me I don't even speak English very well. <laughs> so I, I hope the translators uh, are doing a good job. So <clears throat> my job is to talk about heart failure and talk about extending the limits. And I have to do that in a very short period of time, which is a little difficult, uh, as you will see. But this slide summarizes some of the recent successes that we've had in the treatment of heart failure, and it is such a great area of cardiology to work in because we have so many large, randomized, positive trials with both drugs and devices. Although I would have to say, by the beginning of this decade, we had got a little bit despondent. We hadn't seen any new drug therapy, any new class of drug therapy that had reduced mortality for almost 10 years. Our most recent positive trial at that time was with a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist extending the indication for those agents to a broader population of patients with milder symptoms, but there really hadn't been anything new that reduced mortality for a while, and people were getting a little bit depressed. Uh, there didn't seem to be any further potential for blocking the renin-angiotensin system. There didn't seem to be any further potential with drugs to inhibit the sympathetic nervous system. Other neurohumoral systems that we tried to block had been unrewarding. There was really no benefit from, for example, endothelin receptor antagonists or uh, arginine vasopressin antagonists. Uh, our view of inotropes was that they increased mortality rather than reduce mortality. And as we were getting close to the 50th anniversary, of the first heart transplant, there had been no significant progress in transplantation. So people were maybe a little bit <laughs> depressed at this point, but things have changed and I want to take you forward from where we are today. And in 2014, we had a new breakthrough. We had a change in our paradigm about the thinking of how we treat heart failure. And for the first time in 15 years, we identified a new class of drug that would reduce mortality. And of course, that new treatment was neprilysin inhibition. And we were able to give neprilysin inhibition using a, a compound really of two drugs, Valsartan, which was just a, a RAS blocker that we knew very well, and Secubitril, which was a neprilysin inhibitor prodrug. And why were we doing this? Well, we've been trying to figure out how to augment the effects of natriuretic peptides. What we tried to do was not just to block all the detrimental, harmful neurohumoral pathways that were active in heart failure, but we were trying to augment the potentially beneficial protective neurohumoral pathways and of course, there's no better example of those than the natriuretic peptides. Those are the heart's own defense against pressure and volume overload. And what we were trying to do was to augment the activity of natriuretic peptides and maybe other uh, potentially beneficial neurohumoral pathways. And to do that, we knew that if we inhibited this enzyme called neprilysin, which is responsible for the breakdown of natriuretic peptides, we would augment natriuretic peptide levels. And in fact, after 25 years of trying to do this on and off with different compounds in different ways, we were finally successful. And of course, that was in the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial, where compared to renin-angiotensin system blockade alone, addition of neprilysin inhibition to a renin-angiotensin system blocker and, of course, beta blockers and so on, further reduced morbidity and mortality as you can see here, by 20%, and indeed all-cause mortality by 16%. So things changed in 2014. Suddenly, we had renewed hope for the treatment of heart failure, 
And I want to spend the rem remainder of my talk telling you, in fact, that there's lots of hope. There are many more things that we think we can do for, for heart failure. We really are pushing the therapeutic limits. And indeed, we're hoping to extend the success of neprilysin inhibition in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. The one heart failure phenotype where we don't have strong evidence uh, that we can reduce mortality and morbidity with other drugs, although I know Mark Pfeffer would probably say, well, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists are beneficial in this type of heart failure, but, but there's some uncertainty still about that. Now, you might wonder why might neprilysin inhibition be beneficial in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, and the reason for that is summarized on this slide. So firstly, we know that patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction have a diminished, have a reduced natriuretic peptide response to volume loading. So that's one problem. The second problem is that when natriuretic peptides bind to cell, cell surface receptors, like on the cardiomyocyte, they augment uh, an intracellular second messenger pathway, which includes cyclic GMP. Intracellular cyclic GMP is broken down by an enzyme. It's phos phosphodiesterase, PDE9, and that enzyme, the activity of it is upregulated in people who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So inside their cardiomyocytes, the activity of that enzyme is increased. So not only is there reduced natriuretic peptide secretion, but when the natriuretic peptides bind to the cell surface receptor, the intracellular, intracellular second messenger response is diminished because of upregulation of this enzyme. And of course, cyclic GMP is considered to be critical in, for example, uh, regulating myocardial stiffness and relaxation. And maybe more importantly than all of that is that we've actually done a proof of concept phase two trial with Sucubitril Valsartan in patients with HEPPEF, showing that it reduces NT proBNP. That's just uh, an inactive, essentially, marker of left ventricular wall stress, reduces left atrial size. Again, we believe a measure that integrates uh, uh, left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So we have designed and we have conducted, and indeed, we have just completed this large phase three morbidity mortality trial with Sucubitril Valsartan in patients with HEFPEF called Paragon Heart Failure. And in fact, the database for this trial was just locked on Friday, uh, in other words, yesterday. So uh, it's the largest ever HEFPEF trial to date. We've enrolled 4,822 patients. As you can see here, Brazil contributed to this trial, as did uh, 42 other countries in the world. Uh, we've described the design and the baseline characteristics of this trial already. If you're interested, you can read more about them. Just to point out maybe one or two snapshots of those. So this is really quite different than heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Typically, we have about 20 to 25% of patients, for example, in Paradigm, who are female. Here you can see in Paragon, actually 52% of patients are female. They're a full decade older, 10 years older on average than in the typical HEF-REF trial, 73 rather than 63 in Paradigm and so on. So really a quite distinct patient population, different heart failure phenotype. And I stole this slide off Mark because he <laughs> pointed out yesterday that he used some of mine. And uh, my uh, colleague, friend, and co-principal investigator, Scott Solomon, will present the results of this trial uh, at the ESC Congress 
in a few weeks' time. So this is going to be an exciting year in heart failure, and this is one of the reasons why this will be an exciting year in heart failure. And there are other things going on with Sucubital Valsartan. So in this part of the world, as you know much better than I do, uh, this type of heart failure, and I notice our co-chair shares the same, na uh, same name, this type of heart failure is a particularly deadly, a particularly morbid type of heart failure, much worse than other non-ischemic forms of heart failure in terms of morbidity and mortality. We managed to have enough cases in two of our large trials to do this analysis, and recently uh, a trial has been set up that will be led by Renato Lopez uh, here, from here in Brazil, uh, looking at Sucubital Valsartan, specifically in Chagas uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So we'll hear much more about this drug. But it doesn't stop there. There are many more things in the pipeline. Uh, another way to augment intracellular cyclic GNP is to stimulate uh, an enzyme that produces its soluble guanylate cyclase. That can be done with a drug called Verisiguat. And again, as many of you may know, there is a large trial called Victoria, 4,800 patients randomized to placebo or Verisiguat. This trial has completed randomization and it is completing follow-up and we will get the results of the Victoria trial quite soon as well. So as you can see, there's a story here that there's a lot of new things happening, a lot of exciting things happening in heart failure. And in fact, even we've even revisited this question of inotropes that we were so negative about. The cardiological community, the heart failure community in particular, had really been quite negative about the idea of using inotropes. But there is a new agent. It's perhaps not correctly described as an inotrope, Omicaptive macarbal. It has been described as a cardiac-specific myosin activator that does not have the characteristics of a conventional inotrope, but does improve left ventricular systolic performance. So it doesn't increase myocardial oxygen consumption. It doesn't increase intracellular calcium or cyclic a AMP, the things that we believe led many of the previous inotropic agents we used to increase the risk of ventricular arrhythmias and sudden death. And actually, the characteristic pharmacological signature uh, sign of the action of this drug is a slight prolongation of systole due to slight, slightly better binding uh, between actin and myosin. We did do a phase two proof of concept study with this drug, as we often do. The purple bars show you the effects of omocaptal macarbal, the placebo bars, the, uh, sorry, the gray bars, the effect of placebo. And you can see here, for example, unlike almost any other inotrope I know of, there was a reduction in heart rate rather than an increase in heart rate, perhaps indicating withdrawal of sympathetic tone because of improved overall systolic function. You can see here le reduction in left ventricular volumes, increase in ejection fraction and stroke volume. So effects that we hope would translate into improved clinical outcomes, but as we've learned through bitter experience in heart failure and other disease areas, those surrogate outcomes are not reliable predictors of clinical benefits. And as a consequence, you must do a large-scale phase three trial. And we have been doing this trial. It's called Galactic HF. It is a very big trial. Uh, as you can see here, uh, just this week, we completed recruitment. And there are a total of 8,258 patients enrolled in this trial. And interestingly, a quarter of these patients have been included during an admission to hospital with decompensation. 
And that is the attraction of this drug. It doesn't lower blood pressure. It doesn't worsen renal function. It isn't like the classic neurohumoral agents that we're all familiar with. It could be used in almost any patient with heart failure on top of all of those other drugs. And it literally goes to the heart of the problem in heart failure. In other words, uh, depressed systolic function. And then, as we heard a lot about yesterday, maybe by chance, maybe by luck, whatever, we had the remarkable finding that these drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, can reduce the risk of incident heart failure. In other words, can reduce the risk of new onset heart failure leading to hospital admission. We saw that, as was discussed yesterday, initially in the Emperor Egg Outcome trial, published in 2015, and then every two years since, there's been another study with a different drug in the same class showing the same benefit. And you can see that summarized here for the three trials uh, that enrolled a broad spectrum of patients with type 2 diabetes. In each and every one of them, this substantial reduction in heart failure hospitalization. And then in the new trial, the one that looked at type 2 diabetics who had chronic kidney disease, increased urinary albumin excretion, a very similar effect, a 39% relative risk reduction in heart failure hospitalization. So what we have to move on to now is to find out, well, could we use these drugs not to prevent the development of heart failure, but to actually treat patients with established heart failure. And one of the questions we also want to ask is, can we even use these drugs to treat patients with heart failure who don't have diabetes? Now, you might say, well, why on earth would you want to give a drug that was introduced to lower blood glucose uh, to manage patients with diabetes as a treatment for heart failure in people who don't have diabetes. And there are two reasons for that. One is that these drugs may have non-glucose dependent actions. So again, as I think was shown yesterday, we're all familiar with this really rapid onset of benefit from uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor in patients with diabetes in reducing the risk of heart failure that does not really fit with our previous concepts of the really slow, gradual development of a metabolic benefit of reducing blood glucose. And there are lots of theories about why SGLT2 inhibitors have such a rapid effect in patients with diabetes with respect to reducing heart failure. It might just be because they're good diuretics, they reduce preload, afterload, and so on. It may be because, of course, they protect the kidneys, and the kidneys clearly play an important role in the development and progression of heart failure. But there are other theories. One of the popular theories that you, again, heard mentioned yesterday was that these drugs might improve myocardial metabolic efficiency, and there's some animal data to support that. There are indeed additional hypotheses that these agents also act on uh, other, uh, for example, the sodium hydrogen exchanger, other uh, pathways in the cardiomyocyte. We don't know. But even if these drugs just lower blood glucose, that's still relevant to the vast majority of patients with heart failure because Mark will remember this, but a long time ago when we did the CHARM program, we collected biomarkers and Herzl-Gerstein, who, as many of you will know, is a well-known diabetologist and McMaster, was very keen to look at dysglycemia in the CHARM patients. And whether you look at HEF-REF patients or whether you look at HEF-PEF patients, the blue segment of this pie chart shows you the individuals who had a normal hemoglobin A1c, and you can see that they represent less than one-fifth of the patients with both of these heart failure phenotypes. And not only that, but we know that these patients fairly rapidly progress to develop dysglycemia 
and overt diabetes. So most of our patients with heart failure have dysglycemia, and that in itself is a very interesting issue. So we're going to answer this question, do SGLT2 inhibitors work in patients with established heart failure, and are they of benefit even in patients who don't have type 2 diabetes? We're going to answer that question because we have five ongoing trials looking at this issue. And I'm going to very, very briefly mention these. There are two large trials in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, Emperor Reduced and DAPA-HF. I'm not going to go through the details of them, but they're pretty typical of trials in heart failure. And please note that they have included patients with and without diabetes. We've published the design of the DAPA heart failure trial. And again, you can see here that actually Brazil, of all countries in the world, was the leading recruiter in DAPA heart failure. So if you were a DAPA heart failure investigator, thank you very much indeed, because you really made this trial a success in terms of its rapid recruitment. And again, quick snapshot of the patients in the trial. They're pretty characteristics of HEF-REF patients. But the one thing I will point out here is that only 42% of patients in DAPA heart failure have diabetes. That's pretty typical of other heart failure trials. The slight majority uh, do not have diabetes. So this trial will test the hypothesis that these drugs are potentially a treatment for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Again, very shortly, all the details of the patients enrolled in this trial will appear online. We're hoping, assuming the American Heart Association are willing to accept our presentation, we're hoping to present the results of DAPA-HF at the American Heart Association Congress in November. So two new large morbidity mortality trials hopefully presenting this year. There are two large trials uh, with an SGLT2 inhibitor in patients with HEF-PEF as well. And again, with and without diabetes, Emperor Preserved and the DELIVER study, again being led by Scott Solomon in Boston. And finally, the fifth of these large trials is Soloist, slightly different. It's a slightly different agent. It's enrolling patients who are hospitalized with decompensated heart failure, and it's only enrolling heart failure patients with diabetes, but it is including everybody across the ejection fraction spectrum. So this is the fifth of the large trials that I've mentioned. And they really cover the whole spectrum. And I would like to reiterate something Mark Pfeffer said yesterday. It's remarkable. It was only in 2015 that we got the results of Emperor outcome. 2019, the first of these new trials in a specific disease area has already uh, completed. So we're pushing, we're extending the limits of what we might be able to do all the time. And in fact, these new trials, to some extent, are also addressing what we need to think about much more and that is our whole patient. That heart failure patient who just doesn't have heart failure has many different comorbidities. And in fact, there are other trials that are tackling specific comorbidities in these patients. And just like diabetes is uh, extremely common in patients with heart failure for reasons that we don't fully understand, so is iron deficiency. And there are actually four trials currently running looking to see whether intravenous iron therapy might improve outcomes in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Mark mentioned the trial in sleep apnea yesterday. So we're, we're really tackling each of these comorbidities as a means perhaps to improve outcomes for our multi-morbid patients with heart failure. <laughs>
And then finally, I'm going to mention an area that I actually don't work in, but I thought it was important not to ignore it. And I said, recently, we've had the 50th anniversary of the first heart transplant in South Africa, of course, carried out by Christian Barnard. And in fact, there is even new science that may lead to new clinical uh, developments in heart failure. And using this new, what might be called gene editing technology, it seems as though it is possible to remove the uh, porcine endogenous retroviruses, or PERVs for short, uh, that really have stopped us using pig hearts as, uh, uh, for transplantation, for xenotransplantation into humans. If we can remove these, remove the risk of cross-species infection with these viruses, then there may be a way forward to reduce the, the problem of organ shortage for patients waiting for transplantation. And of course, there are new devices that may ultimately even remove the need to think about transplantation because these are getting better all the time. And you will have seen the recent evidence that the HeartMate 3 device is superior to HeartMate 2. And really, outcomes in patients getting these devices, selected patients getting these devices, are remarkably good compared to the alternative for patients with end-stage heart disease. I'm not going to talk about cell therapy, firstly, because I don't really know about it. And secondly, because I think actually now the, the race is probably being won by the machines rather than by cells at the moment, but I'm sure that could be a subject for discussion. So just to finish with, this slide summarizes all the large-scale phase three morbidity mortality trials underway currently in heart failure, not talking about the many additional trials looking at novel drugs in smaller populations that may never make it to phase three. These are the big trials that if they turn out to be positive, will change our guidelines, will change the, the way that we practice. So we've made a remarkable amount of progress in just 30 years. So this slide shows you stepwise reduction in mortality. This is a beautiful meta-analysis, network meta-analysis, incorporating every single published study with all of these different drugs. And you can see here from when we started with ACE inhibitors all the way through to what I would describe really as now our four pillars of treatment for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, a, a, a blocker of the renal angiotensin system, a beta blocker, a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, and a neprilysin inhibitor. The hazard ratio here is 0.37. That equates to a 63%, 63% relative risk reduction in mortality. I believe that we can push the limits further. I think that we can do better. I think we're living in a very exciting times in heart failure. We continue to make progress. I spoke to you about Sucubitril Valsartan. Believe it or not, we're currently studying more mechanisms and more new treatments in more new trials than at any time ever before in the history of heart failure. So sometimes people are despondent about what's happening, not in heart failure. There's more going on than ever before. And we even are about to report a new trial in HEF-PEF, because that's been the Cinderella uh, heart failure phenotype. There's a new trial about to report, as I mentioned, Paragon heart failure. And there are two large new trials with SGLT2 inhibitors underway. We've certainly not reached the limits. I'm sure that we can go much further. Thank you very much. Thank you.